It's not just Gaza where Palestinians are being displaced. Uh, since the war, we have seen an acceleration with the courts uh, uh, rejecting appeals and uh, approving uh, evictions. Basically, kings and prophets of the Jewish people, history and heritage unfolded here. This is the center of Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, and the center of the Jewish world. East Jerusalem's historical significance for Israelis and Palestinians is another escalating flashpoint in the war in Gaza. Part of this area was originally settled by Yemenite Jews in the late 1800s. Now the Palestinians who live there say that they bought the land that their homes are on before Israel annexed the area in 1967. Today is Monday, October 21st, and this is the issue from VOA. I'm Scott Walterman. And I'm Lori London. This is my home. Yeah, I am here. The home in an East Jerusalem neighborhood where Palestinian Fakhri Abu Diab was born and lived for 62 years has been demolished. From 1967 until this year, until now, I bid for the municipality taxes. Abu Diab says he and his neighbors have tried repeatedly to get building permits, but Israel almost always denies their requests. He says Israel is set to demolish about 100 more houses in his neighborhood. Hundreds of Palestinian homes have been demolished or the Palestinians have been evicted in favor of Jewish settlers. While his children have left, he has stayed. My children and uh, grandchildren rent houses outside, but I make here one room and salon and bathroom uh, a caravan, and now they tell me, oh, Dr. Molshan, where I go? I have nowhere to go. I will be homeless. Daniel Luria is the executive director of Ataret Kohanim, a Jewish land reclamation organization that works to redeem property once held by Jews in Jerusalem. Basically, for the, for the Jew, this is where everything unfolded in Jewish history from Abraham 3,700 odd years ago all the way through to King David 3,000 years ago. Kings and prophets walked here. So when we talk about the heart of Jerusalem, this is it. But the Temple Mount is also a holy site for Palestinians. Israeli human rights groups have tried to defend Palestinians living in East Jerusalem who make up almost 40% of the city's population against the Israeli government's eviction and demolition orders. Aviv Tatarsky works with a non-profit organization working to protect Palestinian rights. Both the, the rights of the families to remain in their homes and the collective rights of Palestinians to keep the Palestinian character of Jerusalem uh, should be uh, pro protected and should be, should be kept. We are supporting the families here who are under uh, lots of pressures. We are uh, finding ways to uh, block moves by the Israeli government, but it's an uh, imbalance of power is not in our favor. The group says these efforts against Palestinians have been stepped up during the past year as the world's focus has been on Gaza. That's so true, Scott, because we really don't hear much about this. We hear some things about the tensions in the West Bank and, you know, more settlements going up. Um, but really, the, the, the stories that have been dominating so heavily have been obviously the war in Gaza and, and now in Lebanon. Well, as you just heard in the interviews that we just played, that some of these people believe that's exactly why this is happening in greater numbers right now, because everybody's attention is focused elsewhere. Let's get some more insight on this less talked about issue that really has been at the heart of the historic dispute between Israel and the Palestinians. Joining us from Jerusalem is correspondent Linda Gradstein. So, Linda, you know, there's so much going on in that part of the world right now. Yes. Gaza, uh, you know, Lebanon. And then there's this other situation that isn't talked about too much, but that, that's happening as well, along with the the war continuing, and that is uh, in East Jerusalem. You've been following a story about displaced Palestinians. What um, what are you learning about what is happening now in real time? Well, it's a very complicated legal uh, situation. It is in the neighborhood that uh, is called Silwan, 
um, which is uh, an area of East Jerusalem that's actually very close to the old city of Jerusalem, very close to the uh, Dome of the Rock, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, uh, which is holy to both Jews and Muslims and has often been a flashpoint in the past. And um, part of this area was originally settled by Yemenite Jews in the late 1800s. And so the a Jewish settler organization called Ateret Kohanim has been trying to take back control of that. Now, the Palestinians who live there say that they bought the land that their homes are on before Israel annexed the area in 1967. So you've got competing legal claims over this uh, same neighborhood. But what seems to be happening now since the war started over just over a year ago is that these demolition orders against some of the homes that are built or expanded illegally, as well as eviction orders, given the fact that this was originally originally Jewish property, going back, as I said, to the Yemenites in the early late 1800s and early 1900s. They left, by the way, in 1930 during Arab riots. So these things had all kind of been put on hold, and several Israeli human rights organizations had uh, been trying to help the Palestinians uh, fight these issues in court. And uh, now these orders are being enforced. I don't know if it has directly to do with the war. I don't know if it's because sort of the world's attention is focused on Gaza and Lebanon and Yemen and all kinds of other things. And so it's an opportunity to do it. Um, It's not clear exactly why it's happening now, but it has the potential to really uh, reignite tensions in Jerusalem. One of the ironic things is that since the war started, Uh, Jerusalem has been relatively quiet. Uh, There have been a few isolated attacks uh, by Palestinian gunmen on, uh, you know, border policemen and stuff in Jerusalem. But it's actually been very quiet. And this has the potential to really reignite it. I spent a day in this neighborhood with, uh, you know, meeting the Palestinians there and with uh, one of these uh, Israeli human rights groups called Iramim that is trying to help the Palestinians. So frame this for us in um, the larger struggle between the Palestinians and Israel. So technically, this is West Bank or part of what would be the Palestinian territory or Palestine if there ever is a state, right? Well, not really. I mean, it's part of Jerusalem. So it's a little different from the West Bank because in 1967, Israel annexed East Jerusalem, including the old city, including the holy sites, and including this neighborhood of Silwan. So it annexed, you know, all of these Palestinians. So they have um, Jerusalem residency, uh, but they're not Israeli citizens. Now, most of them don't want to be Israeli citizens, but they are Palestinian residents of Jerusalem. The population of Jerusalem, by the way, is 40 percent Palestinian. So the question of what would be this was not part of Jerusalem or Israel before 1967, but unlike the West Bank, Israel actually annexed uh, East Jerusalem in a move that has not been recognized by the international community. At the same time, most people believe, you know, you can't put up a wall anymore. You can't divide Jerusalem again. So if there ever were to be a Palestinian state, then there would have to be some sort of answer because the Palestinians say East Jerusalem has historically been ours. We want East Jerusalem. And that the the solution that I've seen that kind of makes the most sense is that the United City of both West and East Jerusalem would simultaneously be the capital of Israel and Palestine. Perhaps, uh, you know, different neighborhoods would function. I mean, there's all kinds of creative things that can be done. But right now, um, you know, the two sides are just kind of entrenched and the war has made that even more so. But as you mentioned, the annexation of this um, part of Jerusalem isn't recognized by the international community. So technically, according to the 1947 agreement, it's still Palestinian territory, no? Well, I don't know. I mean, the thing is that... uh, You know, Palestinians say that East Jerusalem must be the capital of a future Palestinian state. Israel says that the United Jerusalem will be forever the capital of of Israel. 
And I think that there's an important legal difference, which is whether or not the international community recognizes it. It's been annexed to Israel, just like the Golan Heights, by the way, um, as opposed to the West Bank and Gaza. So there is an important difference because it would, I just don't see, I can't foresee any kind of agreement that Israel would ever accept that gives up its control over East Jerusalem. Now, what has happened is the holy sites that I mentioned earlier, there's what's called the status quo. So the uh, the mosques, which is the same site as the ancient Jewish temples and which has long been a flashpoint of violence, that's run by the waqf, by, the, by a Jordanian-based religious holy trust. And in fact, another uh, thing that's been changing, which is separate from the story that I've been working on, which is that according to that status quo agreement, Jews are not allowed to pray on this area. This area is for Muslim prayer only, even though it was the site of the Jewish temple. Jews are allowed to visit, but not to pray. More and more Jews have been openly praying at the site, which is also increasing tension. And Hamas, by the way, Hamas's name for the October 7th attack that killed 1,200 civilians and that started this whole war that has now killed 40,000 Palestinians in Gaza is the Al-Aqsa flood. So they kind of take it back to the Jerusalem holy sites. Well, speaking of of the situation in Gaza, I think the world was looking at a major turning point in the past week with the death of uh, the Hamas leader. Of Sinwar. Mm -hmm. Of Sinwar. Um, And it it looks like the the war is is continuing to ramp up or just continuing. Right. Israeli, Israeli attacks are continuing, and I know the hostage families, you know them, some of them personally. Mm hmm. Um, mm-hmm. they, they're very frustrated. They've been coming out. Um, we have the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, now uh, in the region trying to sort this out in some way to, to get to a peace uh, ceasefire situation with the hostage release. What are you hearing from, from folks on the ground there? And what is what is the overall mood as far as this war continues so the thing is that Sinwar's, uh, you know, killing by Israel offers both an opportunity and a challenge. It offers an opportunity because Israel's prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, can say, we won the Gaza war, we, you know, assassinated him, um, and now it's time for Israel to withdraw, which is what more and more military people uh, are saying, that basically Israel has achieved what it can militarily and, uh, and has not managed to completely defeat Hamas. At the same time, Sinwar was kind of the address of, uh, you know, if he made a decision, if he signed a deal, it would be observed. In terms of the hostages, it's not clear that anyone even knows where all of them are. Uh, They were apparently not all being held by Hamas. Some of them are being held by other groups like Islamic Jihad. Um, So, you know, Israel says it won't sign a deal. It's also not clear how many are still alive. And in terms of the hostage families, the ones, my friends, Rachel and John, whose son Hirsch has become, you know, famous, um, Sinwar was apparently using the six, as the, as Rachel calls them, the beautiful six, um, including Hirsch, as human shields for over a year. Uh, they were emaciated. They were starved. And when he fled, um, ordered them killed. And the reason he didn't take them with them is because they were so weak that uh, they couldn't even move from, from where they were. And that's when he fled to a different part of the tunnel. It's not clear why he came up to the ground. Maybe he wanted a picture of himself fighting Israel. Again, it's not clear why he came up. But but apparently, uh, you know, these hostages were held with Sinwar for over a year. So the question now becomes, you know, I think most Israelis who started the war thinking, you know, this was a just war and this is something that had to be done. Um, and now there doesn't but but there doesn't seem to be any kind of end game. Netanyahu has refused to talk about any kind of future for Gaza. And just today there was a um, a, 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 a gathering of. Uh, thousands of people, including quite a few members of Netanyahu's Likud government, who were calling for Jewish settlements to be built in Gaza. People have been talking about that for a while. And um, do you think that that is a realistic 
um, a goal for them that they, they can start building in Gaza the way they've built in the West Bank? No. No, I really don't. I mean, it is possible that the Israeli military will continue to control a strip of northern Gaza to make sure that what happened on October 7th can never happen again. But I do not see the likelihood of settlements being built. I think it's it, it's not the same situation as the West Bank. The West Bank was, you know, the, Israel had biblical ties to it. Jews had ties to it. Um, I don't see that happening in Gaza. Um, but unless Israel is going to be willing to allow uh, some type of whether it's the Palestinian Authority, uh, I don't see the Arab countries, the Emirates, Saudi Arabia being willing to take over Gaza without, uh, you know, some kind of uh, Palestinian input. And at this at this point, that means the Palestinian Authority, which controls the West Bank. Um, and that's the Biden, you know, President Biden has talked about a, a more empowered Palestinian Authority. Look, the Palestinian Authority is led by Mahmoud Abbas, who is either 80 or 89. He's on like the, you know, 17th year of a four year term. And he's refused to um, appoint any kind of a successor. There are some younger leaders, including some of whom are in Israeli jails. One name being mentioned often is Marwan Barghouti, who I also know, um, and who also has ties with Hamas and who's in jail for his uh, involvement in the second intifada, the murder of, I think, five uh, people during that time. Um, But I you know, I think that without any kind of there's no military solution to this. Um, and that's what I think Israel has learned, which might be somewhat different from the situation in Lebanon. But in Gaza, there is no military solution. And so unless you're willing to have some sort of a political uh, future, then it's the fighting could just be going on. As you said, there are many uh, that would agree that there is no military resolution at this point. How are Israelis feeling about this current state of affairs as far as politically and without knowing where this is going? Are they how do they see this from a political standpoint? Well, you know, actually, Netanyahu has been gaining support. I mean, I think a lot of Israelis who might have starved before the war in Gaza would have said, you know, we have to reach a deal with the Palestinians. You know, we have to have some kind of Palestinian state now say uh, that's not possible and the Palestinians are not interested in peace and, you know, that that there's no one to make a deal with. That said, there is a deal on the table, and that's been on the table since, I think, May or June, for a ceasefire, the return of the hostages, and the release of thousands of Palestinian prisoners. Uh, And I think that if Netanyahu went with that deal or was pressured by President Biden to go with that deal, uh, most Israelis would support it. I mean, I think the war, people are... Um, you know, the whole country is kind of traumatized. There's kind of jokes that the whole country needs a therapist and things like that. Um, You know, you now have uh, Israeli, you know, uh, young people doing their second, third, fourth round of reserve duty, leaving their wives and kids at home. And every day you hear of one or two soldiers getting killed. Um, So the sort of um, euphoria almost at the beginning of the war, I think, has turned into heaviness. That said, at the same time, Israel has been making a lot of progress on the war in Lebanon. And so that's really helped Netanyahu as well. Hmm. Linda, thanks so much for the info. Sure. That was correspondent Linda Gradstein coming to us from Jerusalem. It really is an interesting situation. You can hear how it's phrased when they say, well, no, Israel annexed that land, but then say However, that annexation isn't uh, recognized by anyone else in the world. Yeah, and and that's true. It, 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 words and phrasing is different depending on who who is talking about it. We hear some people saying, you know, occupied territory, occupied land, occupied East Jerusalem. Other people say, you know, annexed. Um, and I'm sure the Palestinians would have a different um, way of framing it as well. And you know, obviously, this is such a deep-rooted dispute that's at at the heart, as we've heard, of so much of of where things are and continue to be, that it's it's sort of hard to understand where this can go, particularly as Linda was saying, there's no military solution to all of this. It seems more important than ever for, you know, some sort of diplomatic solution, but that doesn't seem 
That seems very elusive. Well, it's what makes the two-state solution so difficult. Where do you draw the lines? What part of this land is Palestine and what part is Israel? This has been The Issue from the Voice of America. On behalf of everyone here at VOA, thanks so much for spending this time with us. Follow The Issue on X and Facebook at VOA The Issue and for news 24-7 on our website at voanews.com. In Washington, I'm Scott Walterman. And I'm Lori London. We'll see you tomorrow.